Winning Cures Everything. Now for your hosts, Gary and Chris. Welcome in to Winning Cures Everything. I am Christopher Giannini. It is the Tuesday night solo show. If you're listening to this on the podcast, you got it Wednesday morning or anytime after that that you'd like. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, we're going to get back to a regular schedule. Last week, we appreciated Kyle coming on with us, and, and, and that kind of jacked up our schedule a little bit. But we got to do all the draft stuff that we really enjoyed. If you like that sort of thing, go check it out. We missed a lot of news and stuff, but I'm not going to go backwards. I'm only going to go forwards. And, uh, and we're going to talk about some things that's happening right now. But before I get into it, Gary's always on me. I got to get the plugs in. I got to tell you, go to winningcureseverything.com. Gary's worked really hard on the website. We're putting every video we do up there, everything we do, whether it's for SBR, for ourselves, um, anything that we write, it all goes to the website. Go there. You can find all the information you want about us. I brought up SBR. SBR is who pays the bills for us. We appreciate them. We love our partnership with them. And, uh, and they take good care of us, so we hope that you guys are checking them out. Go to their YouTube page, SBR Picks slash NCAAF is where you'll find our stuff for them, but you can find their Major League Baseball stuff. You can find their NFL stuff. You can find their NBA stuff. You can find their hockey stuff. They got content on any sport that's going on right now. You go to their website. You can find writing there. We appreciate their partnership. Let's get on with the show. Uh Tonight, I want to talk about the Braves relief pitcher. Jacob Webb hits Kevin Pillar for the Mets in the face with a 94-mile-an-hour fastball last night. He's okay. He's got some fractured sinuses, I think. Man, everything in the face is so connected weirdly that, that I don't really understand how it all works. Not a doctor. Used to play one when I was little. Um, but it is um, – it's not good. But he's going to be fine. Here's here's the deal. And and if you've listened to anybody in, in the baseball world say this, I've heard a million people have an opinion on it, but they all say the same thing that I kind of agree with. And that is Major League Baseball has a problem with relief pitching. They don't teach anyone to pitch at all anymore. It is only all about velocity. Control is irrelevant. Throw hard, throw hard, throw hard. That's it. We're going to get them out with gas, and, and, and if you can control it, great. If you can't, we don't care. This is becoming a, an issue. There have been more hit batsmen in the major leagues at this point this year than any year prior. And and what's sad is is I grew up so so you know you know I like the Padres I'm a Red Sox fan obviously but like one of the teams that I've kind of grew up one of my heroes was was Tony Gwynn so so I grew up really liking and enjoying the Padres um, now this is well after Tony's days but they had one of the best relief pitchers in 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 my era of watching baseball in Trevor Hoffman. And Trevor Hoffman couldn't throw the ball 80 miles an hour, man. I mean, he he just didn't. He got you out with precision, change of speed. You didn't have to throw hard. You just had to make sure your changeup was different than your fastball, but it looked the exact same, okay? It was all about timing and accuracy. You know, I grew up in a day and age where I also worshipped at the feet of Greg Maddox, who couldn't hit 90 miles an hour if he stayed out there all day long. These are two of the best pitchers that I've ever watched throw a baseball in my life. And they're both Hall of Famers. And in today's baseball, they would never have even been drafted. There's not a minor league, there's not a double A, single A minor league baseball team that they could have made a roster on. And they're two of the best pitchers in my entire lifetime. Baseball's going backwards, and they've got to figure out a way to start going forwards. Somebody has to start teaching these kids not just control. Control is the bare minimum. They have to start teaching them to pitch. I, I grew up thinking, and I was a Neanderthal hitter, okay? I was just a big guy that, that you know, swing bat hard, hit ball far. Like, that's, that's all I knew about baseball, all right? I was a moron. Pitchers were supposed to be the smart ones. 
All right. They were the ones that was playing chess while the hitter was just up there trying to hit, you know, a BB. And I, we've got to find a way to get back to that. A, it was a beautiful game when we did it, but also it's for the safety of the game. We can't continue to go forward with the sport and having guys come up here that every one of these, if you are in a relief bullpen, if you're coming out of the bullpen, you're throwing mid nineties at a minimum of your fastball. All right. 94 is the slowest. Anybody's coming out of the, the, the bullpen throwing, but you got to learn some control. And I would rather you back that. I'd rather you lose five or six miles per hour, but learn how to pitch, learn how to put a ball where you want it. And, and the game has to go that way. Um, it's, it's something that, that I hope there's change in. I doubt there's going to be, um, I'm curious if things like what Theo Epstein in baseball has talked about doing, if he can ever convince them, excuse me, to move the mound back a little bit, maybe two or three feet, that would help because then the velocity is just not going to be there. By the time it gets to the plate, you're going to have to learn to pitch, um, you know, or it's going to give the hitters a couple, you know, split seconds earlier to get out of the way if there is a wild pitch, but Neither here nor there. This is something baseball has got to fix. It's something I hate that's in the sport. It, at no point in time did, did Webb try to do this. This is not an intentional thing. He was very upset. He's talked about today how I think he was quoted saying, like, it's it's hard to come back from that. You know, like, it's just really hard when you just destroyed someone's face to, to take the mound again in a couple of days. So um, he's going to have to figure that out. But the best thing he can do is work on his control. And the best thing that the Braves pitching coaches can do is allow him to work on his control. And if that means he loses a little bit of velocity, that's fine. So, moving on. More Neanderthal news from the sport of baseball. This is, this is just the news of the ridiculous today. White Sox manager, Tony La Russa, Hall of Fame manager. We're talking about one of the most respected men in all of baseball. This is, this is a couple of quotes. Vows discipline. Val, when was the last time anybody vowed something? He vows discipline on Yermir Mercedes for swinging at an 0-3 uh, pitch that was thrown by an outfielder that in a blowout game against the Twins the other night and hitting it to the freaking moon. Okay? That – he vows discipline. We're vowing things now. What What are you doing, Tony? This, this is another quote he has. Tony promises there will be punishment. What What world are we living in right now? What is What are these unspoken rules? Like this isn't a thing where somebody physically got hurt. All right, or you hit a home run, and so now I'm gonna beam you. We're, we're not. This is just we're just playing baseball. Yeah, we're up by eleven runs. All right, and when I'm done, we're up by 15 runs because I just smashed one to the moon, the bases loaded. All right, you don't want me to hit it to the moon, don't let me hit it. Okay, this is a problem. But we, these old school, old rules of baseball have to go away. We got to get them out of the sport. We got to get them as far out of the sport as we can throw them. They, they have to be gone. We have to be done with this. All right, we need to make the game more fun. We need to make the game. Look, there's nothing fun about sitting in a game where one team is beating another team 15 to 3 or whatever the score was. All right. There's nothing fun about that. You just want to get it over with. Well, unless baseball is going to institute a run rule, okay, or a time limit that this game ends in four hours if one team is up by eight runs or more, something of that nature. Until we do that, everybody out there has the right to keep playing. They actually have the responsibility to keep playing. Oh, and not that this matters at all, because it doesn't matter if this was the first at bat that Mercedes had in a new 15-year contract, but Mercedes is in his contract year. So every home run, every RBI is going to equal dollar signs next year. But guess what? I don't give a damn if this was the first at bat that he ever hit after signing a new 15-year deal and he didn't he could have struck out the next 300 at bats and he's going to get paid all his money. I don't give a damn about any of things in the contract. You want to hit it to the moon? Hit it to the freaking moon. You want to dance around the bases? Dance around the bases. You don't like them dancing? Get them out. 
if you're a pitcher and you get them out and you want to fist pump and you want to point your finger at them and you want to shout and you want to get excited, do that. We live in a world where in baseball, there's no middle ground. There's either it's a gentleman sport or we hate each other. I watch a, Gary over the years has, has converted me into the UFC a lot more. I watch a lot more UFC now. And you know what I notice about these guys? They, they will literally trash talk one another. And, and you would think there's real dislike in there. And one guy goes into the ring and beats up another guy. And when it's over, both of those guys are hugging when it was over. The guy that just got beat up will go hug the guy that beat him up. And he understands, I got beat today. And that's okay. These are people that are physically trying to knock one another out. In baseball, if you beat me and you celebrate or show any emotion at all, it's it's wrong, it's bad, it's, it's, it's not fair to me. Like, how soft are we? Man, this is a sport I love. I want it to change. I just want it to be better. I don't want to stop loving it. I'm, I'm here for the fight, guys, okay? I'm here. It, I've got so many friends that grew up loving baseball. And now they're done with baseball, okay? They don't watch it. They don't have the passion for the sport anymore. It's easy to walk away. I love this thing too much. This was the first love I ever ever had in my life was baseball. I'm I'm not letting it go. I'm here for the fight. I'm going to make it better. I'm going to scream to the rooftops until everybody hears me. And I hope that other like-minded people that love the sport will do the same thing. Don't stop until they bend to your will. I hate that mob mentality. I don't like it in our society, but baseball has to change. It just has to. And I love it too much to let it stay the same. We got to get rid of these bullshit rules. Somebody needs to put a hand on the shoulder of Tony La Russa and say, thank you for all that you've done to the sport and gracefully walk him into the pasture because this is it. We're done. He, he cannot tell his star player Stop swinging the bat. Last year, the same thing happened. Eric Hosmer tried to tell you know get onto Fernando Tatis, and the first thing I said was, "I want Eric Hosmer on a bus to Pluto." And his manager said, "We're going to talk to him." And I wanted the manager fired and hurled into the ocean because no, this is not. You do not discipline these guys. Let them play the game and let them have fun doing it. And you don't want them hitting moonshots in blowout situations, then don't hang it. That's all I know how to tell you. Intentionally walk them. I don't know what to tell you. Try to get them out. That's all I can say. The next story is, um, this is a coach that I want to do well. I really want him to be in the league for a while. A, being a Browns fan, I I appreciate and respect losing franchises and I would like to see them turn themselves around you know at some point in time everybody deserves the right to have a winner and cheer for one I really want Dan Campbell to be good in Detroit I really want Dan Campbell to be good okay hear me when I say that Dan Campbell's saying some some insane shit right now okay some of it I like some of it I'm a little confused about and some of it I'm calling him on his bullshit okay all right, I'm, I'm, he's shortened the pot, and we're going to get to that. All right, Detroit Lions coach Dan Campbell is back to saying insane things. This is what I wrote for my notes. Dan Campbell says he wants a pet. I like the word, use of pet there. A pet lion at practices. He said he wanted the lion to take a dump in the center of the field. And somehow. Uh, playing in a field full of uh, lion feces, it will make the players tougher. I guess I just roll around and poop, and uh, you know toughen you up. Thought that was thought that was interesting. I'm not really sure how that makes them tougher. I, I also don't think I also don't think you need the lion if you just want them to roll around in a bunch of poop. I I, I think you throw a couple of those offensive linemen up high fiber diet for breakfast and i mean we can we can get that after warm-ups if if that's what you're interested in i i don't know that you need the lion i don't know how many people have pet lions um and i found this to be really strange it's easy to laugh at dan campbell and see him as a joke but i i want for the lion's sake 
the Detroit Lions, not the pet lions that are going to shit everywhere. I want them to be good. I want their fan base to have somebody to cheer for. I want the Ford family to have something that they can be proud of. This is an, this is an old school city that was real important to our country at one point in time. And, and they have been left behind and forgotten. Listen, Cleveland was that way for a long time. The nineties were a bad, bad place for the Cleveland Browns in the, in the city of Cleveland to begin with as a whole. Detroit is become very much a cool hipster city. I'm sure it's still got massive amounts of problems, many, many, many poor areas still. Um, but as a city, they're coming back. The Lions need to have some time. I would say rebirth. I don't know that they ever had much birth. Um, I want good things for them. Here's here's where I'm calling Campbell out. This is where – so. All right, you want a pet live lion? I'm gonna call. I'm gonna use the word live lion, okay? Because I don't, I don't really know if it's a pet. Like, if you've heard, I don't know what how much of this is being picked up. My, my dog is like zoomed through this room like 30 times since we've done this show. It, that's a pet, right? A lion, not a pet. Anything that can kill you, you don't have control over. I, I don't think that works as a pet. Anyway, I'm getting off on a tangent here. Here's, here's my problem. At the end of his comment about this, last thing I remember him saying is this. Coach said he was willing to lose an arm to win a Super Bowl. Now, I know that seems a bit extreme. That, that's, that's a high price to pay. But he's shortening the pot. He's shortening the pot a lot. Because if you're not going full dick – then I don't want to hear it, all right? You can get off my lawn with trying to lose extremities if you're going any extremity outside of full dick because Mike Vrabel threw down full dick a couple of years ago, okay? Nobody gives a damn about you losing an arm to win the Super Bowl when this man said he will cut off his penis, all right? nobody. There's not a man in the world that cares at all about you losing your arm to win a Super Bowl when Mike Brabel has thrown down dick. Okay. So I, I think I respected Campbell. I respected his, I liked his craziness. I like that. He's insane. I, I find it entertaining and scary at the same time. And it's something I enjoy watching from a distance. I'm glad he's not my coach, but if he was, man, I, I think I'd support him. I know that I'd look like a maniac doing it, but I, I think I'd be in. But if another coach has gone full dick, you can't give me an arm. You just you just can't, man. That that makes me feel like your heart's not all the way in this thing. And I I don't know. I don't know. That's I I I feel like I'm losing a little bit of my Dan Campbell love. So I got, I got to flip the page here. Last story I'm going to hit on. Talked about some things that made me angry. Very old man stuff. Something that was kind of silly. Uh, this is different. This this part. This part's different. Jeff Passan of ESPN has covered probably deeper and better than anybody. The... Uh, the Drew Robinson story. I don't, I don't know if, if, if you follow the Drew Robinson story or not. I heard Jeff talk about it today on a, on a podcast, on the Tony Kornheiser show podcast, podcast I listen to every day. Whenever it's out, it's one of the few religious podcasts that I have that I just am devout to. I grew up loving Tony and, and, and I think he's smart. I think he's funny. He's everything I want to be in this stuff. And, uh, and he has really smart and funny guys on, uh, this, this was not a funny Funny conversation. Jeff Passan did the Drew Robinson story. Drew Robinson is a um, is a 29 year old baseball player for a AAA affiliate for the Giants right now. Last year during COVID in March, he um, he was going through massive depression. Uh, just broke up with his uh, fiance, I think she was, and decided that he was he was going to take his life. You know. If you if you know that we're talking about the Drew Robinson story, you know it didn't work. He shot himself in the head, and uh, he lost his eye. He said he laid for, 
the the story, the picture that Jeff paints, it's pretty serious. It's pretty scary. It's a little heartbreaking, but it's it, it's interesting to me. He says he pulls the trigger, and the next thing he knows, he opens his eyes. Very has to be an unbelievably strange feeling. I, I have no idea what that was like. And he said he laid there for 20 hours to decide, do I want to live or die? Because because he could have finished himself off if he wanted to. And uh, he chose life, he chose to live. Today, he's back playing baseball less than a year. Oh, I guess it's a little over a year later. He's he's playing baseball. He has lost the, the vision in his right eye, which is insane. He's a left-handed hitter, doing pretty well in the minors. Hit a home run the other night. He is he's dedicated his life to life, to living, to helping others, which is huge can't imagine going through what he went through um and uh and then and then making amends to his family um which he seems to have done there is a jeff passon's got a big big story on this at espn you can go read i think espn has a documentary on their um streaming service that i'm gonna go try to find this weekend um this is this is different i wanted to talk about this because i'm i have no idea where, where I, like my feelings fit with the normal general population. Okay. I, I don't know. I liked to f- f- face these demons. Okay. And, and struggle with some of this stuff before I've gone to dark places. All right. And I, I feel like, I feel like I'm not alone in that. I feel like the I would think the majority of people at some point in time in their life have gone here. Now, I understand that I think I feel the majority of people go there because I want it to be normal. I want it to be something that everybody has struggled with or lots of people have, and it's not uncommon. It, it's not another thing that makes me weird. It's not another thing that makes me feel broken. I don't know that. I don't I don't have the data on that. I don't have the stats on that. But but I know this at at every point in time where I've ever gone to dark places, I I I'll, I don't value this is just complete exposure. I don't I don't value my life so much, but but I also know that my life has value to others. And and I I don't know. There's a there's a selfishness that, a lot of it's a low self-esteem thing and not that's why I, I would ever want to hurt myself. It's, it's who am I to, you know, do something intentional to make all these other people upset and, and ruin their life and ruin their weekends. Um, and, and, and I don't know, it's a, it's a strange thing. All I know is this, that, that if you get to those dark places, find some, find somebody to talk to, reach out to somebody. It's so weird. We live in a world where it, Everybody in the world, man, we talk about mental health and everybody wants to help. But when somebody actually needs help, man, oh, God, I just don't want to be bothered with it. You know, like we've created all these apps and we've created all these, uh, you know, avenues of, of, of getting professional help. But sometimes people just need a friend, you know, like they don't they don't need professional help. They just need somebody to give a shit about them. And and listen to their problems and I don't know, just talk to them. But we don't want to do that. We don't want to talk to people. We want to text them. And, and you know, if somebody does complain about their problems, they have to worry, are people going to think I'm telling you these things because I'm looking for attention? Like, like I know that was something that I was always afraid to even tell anybody that I was struggling because I don't want it to look like I'm, I'm crying for attention, you know? And, and so I just, I never, I never did. Um, I, I tried to tell a friend once and the conversation got awkward. And so then I just started making jokes and goofing around and immediately turned everything away from it the best I could. 
I thought the story was important. I read the article. I, it meant a lot. I, 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 I mean, you know, I cried a lot during it. I thought it was amazing. I thought the, the story Jeff did was pretty incredible. I think what Drew's doing now is, is pretty incredible, and he's getting a lot of attention for it, and he should. He should. What he wants is for people to never, ever, ever get to a point where they ever pull the trigger because the chances of you having the second shot the chances of you being able to weigh the options of do I really want to go through with this? Do I get a do-over? Are just not there. They're just not. If you pull the trigger, it's going to be over. Um, and so you don't ever want to get to that point. We, we need to head this thing off beforehand. So find someone to talk to. Find a friend. It, forget that. You're, you're the person that's hurting. If you think you know someone that's struggling... Don't be a dick, okay? They're not going to ruin your night or ruin your weekend if they got to talk to you for 30, 45 minutes, all right? If you got to give somebody an hour of your time, okay? Help them. Be there. Just listen. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to have any special skills. Just don't be an asshole. That's all. That's that's what people need. They just need somebody to think that they give a shit about them. That's it. So it was a really important story. I want you to take some time this week. Look it up. Jeff Passan, ESPN. Can't miss it. It's easy to find. And I'm I'm going to try to find the documentary this week. I'm sure if it's on their ESPN thing, I just look up, search Drew and uh, Robinson, and it'll come right up. I'm certain of that. Um, so uh, so I'm going to try to watch that. And uh, I, I didn't know if I wanted to talk about that tonight, but it was a good story. I think it's an important story. And, and maybe I'm right. Maybe more people do think like I do. And more people have struggled like I have. And if, if you have, you're not alone. You're not a weirdo. You know, there's just something wrong with you. You just, this is, this is, it's normal. Just telling you don't go through with it. That's all. Like, that's all. You just gotta, you just, we just gotta keep putting one foot in front of the other. Every day. That's it. And, and, you know, surround yourself with people that, that you think care about you and don't worry about if you care about them or not. Okay. So I, I think personally that was always my problem is there were people that I wanted to be friends with. And there were definitely people that, that want it to be my friend, but I wanted these friends over here and I pushed my attention to them and they didn't give a shit about me. And, and they were a good time and they were cool and they were popular, but they didn't really care about me. These people did. But I didn't care about them. And at some point in time in my life, I had to stop. And I just had to turn around. And that's, I, th I think that's where we need to go. And that's, that's, what, that's what I had to do, by the way. I knew those people were in my life that actually cared about me. I just had to give them the attention. And I found purpose. And, I, and I'll tell you this, that's, that's a word I'm really glad I just said. The, the biggest thing that's helped me find any self-worth at all has been having a purpose. If you are stuck at home, if you're stuck inside, if you don't have a job, if you are, are having a problem finding employment, I'm telling you, I know it might be hard to say, I don't want to take this job for very little money, but, but I, you know, I'm, I, I'll lose my health insurance. I'll lose my whatever. Listen, sitting at home does no one any good. Okay. You need to create a purpose. If you don't want to have a job that makes you very little stay at home and you're staying at home, find something to do. All right. Just, just Google how to build a bed and, and literally go find some scrap lumber from some, you know, junkyard and, 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 and get a couple of tools, save up and build a bed. Just, just find something that you need and use every day. Look at the plans online and do it. Do something productive. Give yourself some type of purpose. Okay. In life. And, and, and even if you don't need it, Make some, make a coffee table and give it away. All right. Let somebody else have it. But you doing something that matters to somebody that gives you a purpose is the most important thing you're ever going to do to finding happiness. All right. I feel like I, what I struggle the most is when I feel like I don't have purpose. Now I own my own business. Okay. I own, and, and, and I have people that work with me and they depend on me, but they don't need me. That's, that's the struggle of, 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 I don't have purpose. And so when I have friends that, that, you know, 
they're always doing stuff and like needing things, I'm always kind of overly anxious to want to help. And, you know, nobody wants to feel like they're a burden. And, and the thing I say all the time is use me. Please use me. Please let me do this thing for you because it gives me purpose because it, it, it lets me feel like you actually need me in your life. Even if you don't, even if you just give me some bullshit air in a task that anybody can do, but do whatever you can to find purpose. That's, that's what's helped me. Now I'm not a professional. I'm just a moron that puts down hardwood floors for a living and talks on the internet. But I, I, I think that's important. I went way longer. I spent way more time on that than I should have. If you like the show, share it out with your friends. We appreciate it. If you need help, find help. You can hit me up. Reach out to me on Twitter. Um, my DMs are open. My email is always open. Chris at Crispy, blah, at Crispy Giannini or Chris at WinningCaresEverything.com. Um, either of those. Hit me up. Find me. Um, not that I'll be able to solve all your problems or help everybody in the world, but, you know, I, you know, I, I'll listen to your bullshit. And I won't judge you. I don't judge anybody for anything. I don't care. Um, but anyway, I'm going to say goodnight. I'm going to end the show. Thank you, guys.